Yeah, you can, yeah. Oh, you, okay. Oh, okay. Come, come on. Yeah. <laughs> So the first time I met him was, uh, I've been at GS1 for many years, about 24, 5 years. And in my early days, I was invited at uh, a university to give a guest lecture. And I did do that at Deakin University as a guest lecture, and it was a room full of uh, maybe uh, 80 to 100 students, maybe uh, second year or third year students. And Emil was uh, one of them sitting there. And at the end, of course, of the presentation about supply chain and barcoding and uh, uh, unique identifications, which was what uh, GS1 is all about, supply chain identification, he puts up, the student puts up his hand and says, ah, oh, is the barcode 666, <laughs> what does that mean? Is that, going to, is that the mark of the beast? A question that's open in an open forum, right, <laughs> in the university. And, uh, I had to answer the question, and of course, <coughs> Emil was the one that asked the question, right? And I was wondering this, uh, this guy coming up at 666. I can't remember the answer, but that was enough to keep him quiet. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, this was the time of uh, the Brian, Brian Smith? Uh, um, Barry, Barry Smith. Barry Smith. So they were the big, big, big item. He's on the bank yard. Yes, on the banker? On, yeah. on the banker, yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's my background of a meal. And a couple of years later, after his graduation, he applied for a job at GS1. And of course, uh, I didn't have anything, to, I didn't want to have anything to do with it. Because you have to be one step removed. And uh, he, I, I don't know whether he asked me for reference or not. Uh, I don't know what you're doing. You probably wouldn't know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't happy that I asked that question. No, no, you're right. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so that, that's the background of me first meeting him. Uh, but he's a, he's, a, he's a great guy. He's, a, he's our IT support person, for innovation and uh, technologies. Uh, uh, Emil is uh, married to uh, Samri with two children, uh, four-year-old uh, Samuel, Samuel and two-year-old two Josiah. Josiah. And he goes to uh, with family to uh, Kingsway Christian Fellowship. Christian Fellowship. So on that basis, on, on that background, I'll send him back because I see the food's on the table already. So we'll get some food. You better get the plate first. Get the plate plate. Okay. <laughs> so you lead the way, grab the plate, yeah, and the others can follow. Yeah, because a uh, <laughs> couple of minutes' time, we'll get a meal to uh, uh, speak. Okay, so guys, grab the plate. Okay, well, uh, good, good morning, everyone. And, uh, and to share, I guess, my um, testimony and uh, my background, you know. Um, it's, inter it's an interesting journey that I've come through uh, to get to where I am today in life, and um, um, I'm, I'm very honoured and privileged to be able to share this for the, you know, for the first time after many years, actually. Um, so I've brought back many memories, uh, thinking back to where I've come from and where, where I've got to today, and I guess how the Lord has uh, done a work in me to, um, to get me to this place. Stephen mentioned, um, I have a wife, uh, Samreen, I'm uh, married to her now since 2014. We have two ch children together, um, uh, Samuel, who is now uh, four years old, and Josiah, who's two. And uh, Samreen's background, actually, she's uh, from Pakistan, uh, but grew up in Perth, and uh, came to, moved to Melbourne once we got married, um, and we've lived here since. <coughs> uh, in terms of my background, my parents were both uh, from Jerusalem, so, but my background's <coughs> Greek. And my surname is Sahar. Uh, Sahar is an Arabic name. It uh, essentially means uh, charming or charmer. Mm -hmm. But the original name, the original name was uh, Yanakis, which is a, a Greek name, obviously. And I have obviously a Greek heritage. Uh, the background was that uh, maybe in the early 1800s, during the time of the Ottoman Empire, uh, there was a war that took place in Greece with the Turks. And uh, as a result of that war, our, our family history, uh, they moved or migrated from Greece to Jerusalem. And that's how we ended up as Greeks living in Jerusalem. Now that brings me to my, uh, my parents. So my father's side in particular, uh, he, uh, my father's father, his name was also Emil, my namesake if you like. 
and he uh, was a carpenter by trade. And so he had a factory with him and his uh, two brothers at, at the time uh, in, in Jerusalem with about 50 workers. And they used to make all the fine furniture uh, and, and even custom furniture for, uh, you know, for uh, people high up in, 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 in society at that time. And so the Sahar name, or Sahar Brothers as it was known, uh, was very renowned in, in Jerusalem and uh, around the, the surrounding area. Um, in, in fact, today even there's furniture that uh, we, we have found uh, it's still in people's homes and even for my relatives, they still have pieces of the same furniture with the Sahar Brothers stamp, stamping on there. So um, that, that's sort of the background there with my grandfather and, uh, and his family. But my grandfather had seven children, uh, five, uh, six boys and a, and a girl, my father being the second youngest. And, uh, and during that time in Jerusalem, my, my father was about one years old. And uh, uh, just prior to that, um, it was uh, 1948, uh, of course, when Israel became a nation. And, and things changed very quickly. There was a lot of things going on at that time. Prior to that, they were under the, the, the British mandate. And uh, Jerusalem was a, you know, a different sort of time to be, to be in. And they had it very well. They were very affluent and um, uh, they had a good uh, lifestyle living in Jerusalem. In fact, amongst not just did they have the factory, but they also had a tourism com company as well and uh, a taxi service as well that they would, would, would run. Uh, when, uh, soon after 1948, there was a time of war, if you like, and it became very difficult for them to continue living in Jerusalem. Uh, so much so that they actually, when the uh, Israel was, I guess, divided, if you like, uh, their house and, uh, and, and their factory fell into what's called no man's land which as a result, they had to give up their, their, their home, uh, which is a family home, in fact, incidentally, was built by my grandfather um, as a carpenter. And uh, that house still stands today, believe it or not. Um, it's there in Jerusalem. I haven't visited myself. I haven't been back to Jerusalem. I would love to go. Um, but the house is there, and uh, you can actually rent it out on uh, Airbnb. Um, so if I get the opportunity to go back there, uh, I would uh, love to uh, go and spend time in that place because of the history and background, of course. Um, but my interestingly to note on that is uh, my my auntie still holds the deed to that home. So there's been stories where uh, people have gone back to Jerusalem and uh, reclaimed through the law courts uh, those those properties. Um, but they, they had to leave and uh, they had an opportunity to come to Australia. And uh, and in 1952 they they came by ship from uh, from from Jerusalem to Perth and then from Perth to Melbourne. And my father was only, uh, just as I said, one years old at the time. Uh, my grandfather basically took his family and, and left what they had and had to start over again from scratch in this foreign country, you know, and so far away from home. And very different because for him, the culture shock and the um, not having the same influence and people not understanding who he is and uh, his background uh, made it very difficult for him to try and fit in into this new environment, you know. Over there, he was somebody. Coming here, he was uh, essentially a nobody, even though he was a great man. And um, and so it was difficult uh, for him, especially, to bring up his children uh, in this environment. But he always said to them that he'll, he'll work uh, so that they don't have to. He in, in, in ensured that they did what they could to provide for their children and make sure they went to study and, and, and become professionals. He didn't want them to be working as, as, as hard laborers. So he sacrificed, I guess, his life for the sake of them. And as a result of that, incidentally, uh, my, uh, my parents, uh, my, my, uh, my father's siblings and my father as well, were all well educated in, in medicine and engineering, and lawyers, and my father, of course, is an accountant, uh, which, uh, incidentally, he's, uh, he's been working for the uh, Department of Human Services in, in the city for the past 46 years. He's a uh, certified CPA. And uh, he's uh, 72 years old today, but he's still going strong and, and loving what he does. And I said, well, why don't you retire? And he says, because if I retire, what am I going to do, play golf all day? <laughs> he, he, um, he, he finds that enjoyment out of working with especially young people because he keeps his mind sharp as well. And he's very good at what he does. Um, my mother, on the other hand, um, also brought up in Jerusalem. And uh, unlike my father, who left at the age of just over one, my, my mother actually uh, was there right through to the time she got married. Incidentally, it turns out that my father went back to Jerusalem on two occasions after coming to Australia uh, to where he actually met my mother. Um, it just happens that my mum was living in Jerusalem in the old city um, at the time, so right in the heart of it all. And, uh, and through my father's uh, 
aunties um, who, who knew this, uh, this, this girl, which was my mum, um, it introduced <coughs> her to my father and they got married in Jerusalem. Um, my, mother, uh, my mother's uncle, incidentally, also was a archbishop of the Greek Orthodox Church and, they, and he uh, married my parents and then they uh, within the space of one month and, uh, and then my father brought my mother back to, back to Australia and, and then of course they had me being the oldest of uh, four children so I have two brothers and a sister and we uh, yeah, grew up in Mount Waverley and, um, and this is where I, I guess I come to the next, uh, next, part, next part of, of, of how my life uh, grew up uh, in the early days with my uh, with my parents and the upbringing that I had. And generally speaking, we had a good upbringing, a good middle class sort of upbringing, and uh, we had everything we needed. We uh, were a very happy, close-knit family, and uh, got along great with everyone. Um, uh, and then as the years went on, I guess, um, we got into sport, of course. Uh, I loved cricket, basketball, football, and tennis. I played those sports uh, competitively. Um, I did very well in cricket, actually, and um, one of my proud achievements in cricket in the early days as under-12s was getting a hat-trick and five for 12. Uh, I was a fast-paced bowler, left-arm bowler. And then uh, in under-14s, got my best figures ever, and it was actually the best for the association at the time, of eight for 14 off 10 overs. So um, I wanted to play cricket as a, young, as a young boy. I actually wanted to play for Australia. That was my dream, you know. Um, I didn't have much interest in studies. I, I didn't um, want to, you know, go down the path of studying so much. I just loved my sport, and uh, I really enjoyed cricket, especially uh, I had an opportunity to play for um, district cricket uh, in, in Victoria, and I did try out. I made the first cut, and uh, it came down to choosing me. And the selectors were actually trying to decide whether they take me or someone else. And one was saying we need this bowler, and the other was saying no, we need a batsman. And unfortunately, I wasn't a good batsman. I never focused on my batting; I always was focusing on my bowling. And it, and it just so happened that um, they, I, I got cut, even though I looked the part. I got, I even bought the pants and everything I needed to. Um, to, to play and uh, to play cricket. My problem, looking back now, is that I um, I was short-sighted. I am short-sighted, and so uh, growing up um, from an early age, I had to wear glasses. But as a kid, you don't want to wear glasses because you get teased at school. And so I didn't want to wear glasses. I had no no desire. As much as I, I struggled to read the board from a distance, and always um, tried to look over to my my, my friends to try and see what was being written. Um, but, but in cricket especially, it's so important to obviously have good eyesight, and uh, especially when you're batting. And so um, I didn't start getting to wear contacts till I was later on in, in, in years. Uh, so that was one of the things I guess that held me back, unfortunately, in being able to do my best in cricket and even as a batsman. Um, so that sort of shattered my dreams, I guess, of becoming um, a cricketer. Uh, what really put the nail in the coffin, if you like, was that I was at a family friend's place, and uh, when they asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said I wanted to play cricket for Australia and they said well that's all fine and good but the reality is you're not going to be able to play for Australia and uh, and, 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 and I guess it was a, a hard reality for me to face at that time um, as many probably who like cricket probably may face at, at some point in time um, but life goes on and then so um, later on from that I think at the age of around 16 uh, or 17 my 16 let's say 16 um, being the oldest, one day out of the blue, my mum uh, called us all in. Um, it was a week weekday after school, and she called us uh, to sit around the, the dining table. She had some important thing to say, which was unusual. We, we, we didn't know what to expect, um, and she basically said to us, "Well, uh, your father and I are having a separation." And uh, like, what? That was a complete shock for us. We, we we didn't understand why that was happening. We we're a close knit family. Uh, we had no um, no. I had no idea this would be happening, why this would be happening, because um, there was no, no, no signs of it at all, no, no warning signs at all. And I remember being at the table and having my siblings there, of course, and my youngest brother, who would have been about 11 or 12 at the time, uh, just suddenly bursting into tears and crying. And then we all started crying, and uh, it was a hard, a hard time to go through at that point in time, because um, it was unexpected. And uh, after that moment, um, things turned uh, for us. We all started to go our own way. Uh, we felt very lost, very disheartened, uh, broken-hearted, um, discouraged, questioning why. why. Why is this happening to us? You know, we we are Greek Orthodox. You know, our background. We, we would go to church. We would we would go to church on Sunday, and we thought, well, actually, my my mental thinking was that if I go to church on Sunday, if 
God will look after me and I can do what I want basically the rest of the week. As long as I go to church on Sunday, I'm doing God a favor by going to church effectively. And, and that was my thinking. But when this happened and everything we, we were brought up and raised about, the Greek Orthodox Church and, 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 um, and, and our family values and so forth, that was all broken. And um, it, it just didn't make sense anymore why this is happening. And what's the, per what's the point of going on? You know, in life, when you do get faced with circumstances or situations uh, like this, uh, it really throws a spanner in the works, if you like, and it makes you question a lot of things. Had that incident not happened, I guess there was, who knows, I would have just continued on living life the way I was. And I perhaps wouldn't have um, come to the realizations of the things that I did uh, at that time as a result of that situation. And so when I look back on that, that moment, it was, uh, I guess, a, a pivotal moment for me where and for all of us, where we had to, uh, I guess, question a lot of things about what's really important in life. You know, our sense of security was what was taken, and uh, when that was taken away, uh, you know, you trust your parents most of all, you, your love and faith in them, and the sense of security you have as a family. And when that was taken away, oh, it tore, it tore the heart, you know, right, right here. And uh, that was the real hard part. The next, the next few years after that was really trying because. Although they were going through a separation, my parents, they still lived together under the same roof. And, you know, at the time, three-bedroom home with uh, six of us under that roof. That's when the arguments started to come out and we started to see uh, manifesting, if you like. And uh, I remember crying. I remember um, uh, banging on the, on, the, on, on the walls to try and get attention because it was like they were so focused on themselves and the situation they were going through, but they couldn't see what we as kids were going through. And I wasn't getting, it was like a cry for help, but like, we just weren't getting hurt. We weren't being hurt in that situation, in that moment. And so uh, uh, soon after that, um, uh, at some point, my father ended up buying my mum a, a property, a two bedroom unit in Mount Waverley, just five minutes away, and, uh, and she moved out there. And we had a choice as children uh, to choose which parent you're going to live with. Now, again, for kids <laughs> that make that decision, you know, you love them both. How can you choose one over the other? You know, that's a, that's a tough call. For me personally, I, I didn't want to uh, make that choice. And, uh, and and so I ended up going a, 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 another way, if you like. Um, I ended up um, uh, meeting a, a, a good Christian family, actually. And uh, it's, it makes me emotional because they, 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 they came at the right time for me. And uh, it was amazing. You know, God, God somehow brought this family into my life. And they were Christian. And they shared to me about the Lord. And... Uh, you know, I knew about God and I knew about Jesus and I knew that he died for our sins. I knew that he, um, he rose from the dead. I, I knew all that. I mean, that's what we were taught. I'm, I'm Greek Orthodox. <laughs> uh, but I didn't know him personally. I didn't know him the way they did. And I didn't understand why was it that all my life I hadn't known him the way they, they did. I, I knew him religiously. But I didn't know him personally and I never had a relationship with him. And, and, and they, they, they shared to me and they said, I need to cry out to God and, and, and give him my heart to him and he would heal my heart. You know, it's interesting to know, I couldn't go to um, a doctor to get healing for my heart. I couldn't find a solution to that problem in the world. And I tried, I tried different things, so to speak. You know, I, I didn't go into smoking or drugs and that. I did try alcohol for a little bit uh, as a young person, um, just to, um, you know, to, to, to numb the pain, if you like, of what we were going through. And, and I was certainly searching as, as a person for meaning. And, you know, there were thoughts of committing suicide and things like that at the time because it just felt like, what's the point of life? You know, in school they teach you things like, uh, we evolve from monkeys, evolution, you know. Uh, and when you think about it, if we evolve from monkeys and that's what life's about, then there's no meaning or purpose to life, you know. It's just a, by accident, by chance. And uh, I, I knew that wasn't the case, but I didn't, at the same time I didn't know what the whole meaning, what was I doing here? Why are we going through all this? What, what's the purpose? But after coming to uh, that realization of, uh, that I needed to give my heart to the Lord and, uh, and to give my, commit my heart and, and, and to Him, uh, I remember one night, it was about two in the morning, I got woken by um, a storm outside. It was a uh, pouring rain, thunderstorm. And uh, I remember um, uh, waking to that and the words that they had shared to me earlier on. And, and how um, I looked out the window and it was pouring rain and you could see the thunder of lightning lighting up the sky. And uh, I remember at that moment, I cried out to God. I poured out my heart to him and what I was going through. And in the midst of that, um, I, I basically made peace with God. You know, I, I, I shared everything I'd gone through. And for the first time in my life, I had total peace. You know, I can't explain it. And it just coincided with um, outside, the storm was happening. And then after that prayer, 
I remember it all being still quiet. And, um, and there was a peace in my heart for the first time. And, and that was probably the first moment in my life where I experienced uh, that peace that I was longing for my whole life. And uh, it was an amazing situation. From that point on, things turned around. Um, I started to uh, attend a, a church, a fellowship in Dandenong. It was a big church. Uh, I remember the pastor, Pastor Alan Davies, at Faith, uh, what's now known as Faith Christian Church. At the time, it was Dandenong Christian Fellow, or Dandenong Assembly of God. And he, he, he preached a message called Choices. That we all have choices to make in life. And the choices we make now can determine our destiny. And, uh, and that really struck me. And I remember going into this Christian church for the first time, coming from a religious Orthodox background, and thinking to myself, or seeing, seeing the people and seeing the joy in their faces. You know, I've never experienced that. In church, in, in Greek Orthodox, it was all about, uh, you know, very sorrowful and um, uh, reverence, of course, but um, there was no joy, there was no peace, there was no uh, happiness, there was no uh, rejoicing and, and, and clapping and singing. Or it was a big no-no to clap in church, in fact. Um, and here they were clapping and singing and praising God and lifting their hands up. Uh, that was all foreign to me, you know, all against everything I'd been taught. My mum used to teach me a lot of the Greek Orthodox ways because her uncle, as I mentioned, was an Orthodox arch Archbishop. And so seeing all that, and I remember the first time I was there, I was like this, my hands were crossed, and I, um, I, I felt, you know, is this a cult? I actually thought, is this a cult? What, what's going on here? But it was genuine. And, uh, and, and soon after that, I, I did um, end up attending a, a smaller church and in Dandenong, um, under Pastor... Um, Pastor Jerome LeBroy, and uh, being a small church just starting out at the time, it gave us opportunity, I guess, to to start jo joining and be part of the fellowship and, and getting involved, you know, in ministry. And I had a heart or a desire to study the, the Word, and so I quickly began reading the Scriptures and started with the Gospels and learning all about Jesus. And uh, it now made sense to me. You know, before when I tried to read the Bible, it made no sense. Um, but after coming to know Lord of, the Lord, of course. Um, he illuminated the scriptures and made, made things, uh, you know, uh, understandable in a way that I could also apply it in my life and share it to others. And so God used me um, in ministry. I had opportunities to be able to speak and preach in, in the church. And one, and one time I had the opportunity to preach and uh, in, in, in our church at the time. And uh, I invited my parents to come along. Now, they were separated, never remarried or anything like that, but they were separated and, uh, and still on talking terms and so, so forth. And my heart's desire was always being or longing to see my parents come back together. That was my cry, my heart's cry. And, and, and so um, I had an opportunity to preach. Now my parents, when they saw the change in my life, you know, for example, I used to um, swear a lot. Every second word was a swear word because I was listening to the wrong sort of music. Okay, that was just what was in the, at the time what I was going through um, and that was what I would turn to. One of the first things that changed in my life was that because of the, the heart had been changed, the Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. My heart was changed. And as a result of that, um, I didn't want to swear anymore. I had no desire to swear. Nothing like that was coming out anymore. My parents saw the change in me. So much so that they wanted to come see this person, this timid, shy, timid guy, uh, preach. They couldn't believe it. Uh, they heard me preach that message. And at the end of the message, the pastor invited anyone to uh, commit their life to the Lord. And guess what? My parents both put their hands up to commit their life to the Lord. And uh, that was the first step, if you like. And not only that, I had my brother, uh, one brother, and my sister, who also came to know the Lord and got involved in ministry as well, in the, particularly in the music ministry. And, and so God turned what was, I guess, intended for evil, he turned it around for good. You know, he took that situation, and whilst he allowed it to happen, now I understand why he allowed it to happen, and I thank God that he did allow it to happen. Uh, further on in the years, uh, maybe 12 years later, of, of praying and asking the Lord to be, be my heart's desire. That was the one thing. I didn't know, how am I going to get married? And then I was thinking of all those things and my parents being separated and that. How's it going to be? I just, I really wanted my parents back together. Um, in 2012, um, this is answered a prayer. My, my parents came back together and are now living under the same roof to this day. And the unit that my mum, or that my father bought for my mum, is still there. The rent, my brother lives in that one now, <laughs> but they've been, we've been blessed. What, what the enemy was going to, you know, to come to steal, kill, and destroy, God has restored in, in, in manifold ways. And uh, moving on from that, um, I'll come to my uh, in conclusion now. But um, I came to know my wife actually through um, 
<laughs> through Facebook of all places. Uh, what was interesting about that was that I had tried it my own way as a Christian, so to speak, in, in the sense that I did try to find the woman that I would marry, you know, on my terms, I guess, or, or, or my way of doing it. And, and every time it failed, uh, mainly because I was looking at probably the wrong reasons to, 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 to uh, in the person I was looking to, to marry. So I, 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 get, I, I gave it to the Lord and said, you know, Lord, I've tried it my way and I've failed. I'm going to commit it to you and do it your way. And I was at the time more focused on, you know, um, seeking his kingdom and doing his will. And, uh, and I remember writing these, um, these, these short messages on Facebook and, and posting them. And it just so happened that one of those messages that I had shared, my wife uh, came across it. And she's in Perth, so she, we don't know each other, no common friends. She came across that post. And then she had the desire to, uh, to write to me, to respond. And she, she's a Christian, obviously. And, uh, and, and so we got chatting from that moment on. And in the, in the space of 2013, I think I did 13 trips to Perth that year. Uh, because I was uh, getting to know this person and I, I really, really believed that this was from the Lord. And, uh, and, and of course, that, that just um, um, developed. And uh, in the end, I proposed to her in Perth, in, um, in Rockness Island, on, on top of the lighthouse there. And, and after, after doing so, we, we, we got married in, uh, in Melbourne. So her and her family came to Melbourne and, and the rest is, I guess, kind of history. And, and what a blessing it's been to, to make that right decision. I could have gone a park, you know, um, my own way and made a mess of things. And oftentimes, sometimes you might find or experience in life where things aren't working for you and you try and try and try in your own strength, your own way, your own might to make things happen. And it doesn't. And you get disappointed or frustrated. So some of us are really strong-willed and we'll keep going. We're stubborn sometimes too, you know, as, as human beings. Um, but sometimes you've got to stop and think, hang on a minute, you know what, it's not working. Maybe... Instead of doing it my way, how about I commit it to the Lord and do it His way? And, and in doing so, you'll find you'll get a breakthrough. Because oftentimes, God allows us to do it our way because He's given us a free will and choice. Uh, but, but sometimes, doing it our way is going to mess things up. You know, it's best to commit it to the Lord first and wait on Him and His timing for, for things to take place. Uh, the, other thing I, the other point I'd like to make is also is that, obviously, going through that, um, that heartache and pain, I now understand and can relate to people who are also going through it. My, my heart's desire was also to see young people who's also gone through similar situations and to encourage them, uh, and, 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 you know, that, hey, don't give up hope. There is always hope. There's still a way out through this. Um, you know, uh, people do turn to su suicide and, and drugs and alcohol and other things to, to avoid it. Uh, one of the other the issues I faced often um, when, that, when, when I went through that experience was people would come and ask me, you know, are you okay? And, you know, my first response clearly was, yeah, I'm fine, yeah, no problem. But deep down in my heart, I was in absolute torn up, torn my up, torn, torn, yeah. It was, it, was, it was a really difficult situation. And oftentimes you'll find you need to prompt people a little bit more and ask them again, no, no, seriously, are you okay? Sit down with them and really, um, I guess, um, understand what they're going through and, and show that you care uh, because they will cry out, they will open up to you. Oftentimes people put a barrier up because they're trying to protect themselves because they've been hurt. And, and, um, and that's what I would do. I would put that barrier up because I didn't want to be hurt again. I mean, everything I trusted in, in this life was, was taken from me. You know, it was um, torn and, um, and we really uh, suffered as a result of that. But there's a lesson there in, in closing now. The other, the other point I'd like to make on that note is when, when life doesn't go your way and when things don't seem um, to be going um, the way you expected, you know, don't uh, don't be disheartened by that, and don't be discouraged no. by by that uh, by that situation you're going through. Even when unexpected circumstances happen that are out of your control, you know, many times there are things that are out of our control. We have to kind of roll with the punches, so to speak, uh, and and not be um, disheartened by it, but rather learn from it. Uh, I think of Job and what he went through, uh, and how he suffered many things, you know, to the point where his own wife even told him to curse God and die, but. That's not the answer. The answer is, you know, God does allow things for a reason. And sometimes in that situation, we have to just wait on him and trust him for what he wants to do in, a, in and through a, that situation for us. We can learn from these experiences, you know. And I hope this, this uh, I guess my short story here uh, has perhaps encouraged you personally in what you might be going through or what you may go through. Uh, and, and just remember that um, God obviously loves us all and, and, and wants what's best for us. Sometimes in our own stubbornness or um, uh, because of our strong will or whatever, uh, we, we, we choose to try to do things in our own strength, in our own way. 
And uh, my encouragement is that don't try to do it your own way. Give it to the Lord and uh, let Him direct and guide you in that situation so that you can, like me, overcome and really see the, the, the blessings of God. Amen. Thanks, Emil. Beautiful story. No, no, no. Um, and two things as you were, as Emil was talking, two things that came to mind as you were speaking. One is that God knows us by name. Yeah. Irrespective of where we are, who we are, God knows us by name. And I like the story how it just takes one person in a family to come to know Christ. And he or she will be the one to bring others to. Amen. So we as men are responsible. Uh, to, to, to hold up and fly that flag because if we can hold that flag others will come in our families to hold the same flag yeah. Amen? Uh, I, I did warn you that there will be some Q&A oh, okay. yes. okay, so I've got the first, first question now you married Samarine and Samarine was from Perth yes. apart from you drawing her to Melbourne right, what I mean she had to leave her family she, she had yeah. three, uh, two sisters <coughs> two sisters and a dad she's got that Eight, uh, seven siblings, so her and yeah. seven yeah. others, yeah. And then so, so what actually made her do this? <laughs> let go of everything in person. Come, come over, yeah. Well, um, have you answered that question? <laughs> she reminds me often that she did it because of me, you know. So, um, you know, um, Good she went with me. <laughs> uh, um, what can I say? Um, I, I guess she knew in her heart too that um, you know I was I was the one, and. Uh, we, we never looked back, I guess, and she never had no regrets of, of in doing so, of yeah. course. Um, of course, during COVID, it's been difficult because Perth actually shut the borders, so she can't even go back to, to visit her parents. We would go back maybe once or twice every year since getting married, and uh, and I enjoy their company. I love being around them. Greeks are no different to Pakistanis or Indians or Sri Lankans, you know, big on families. You know, we love being around family and uh, <laughs> fellowshipping and eating together and all that. So, yes, it was a, it was a challenge for her at first, uh, but she settled in very quickly uh, as as my wife and uh, and making herself a home here and uh, and, and, and of course uh, uh, surrounding herself with good uh, uh, family and friends, uh, especially in the church. Uh, that was key uh, in helping her transition to here, and she has made and established that, and which is which is great. Uh, I think that was very important. Uh, my mum reminds me that when she came to Australia, it was very difficult for her as only a 20, 21 year old coming for the first time and leaving her family. And having no one here and starting again was really difficult. But uh, for some reason, um, I think that transition has been easier having that uh, fellowship. Yeah. True, thank yeah. you. Any, any questions for Mill? There's a chance to ask him challenges that, uh, that you may be facing or, or scenarios in his <coughs> story that you haven't uh, been in covered. Yeah, uh, the, the, the point is asking two, uh, two questions. All of my life I've been associated with, with with cricket, and I'm, that's why I've got no friends now because I'm a, I'm a cricket umpire. <laughs> we all love umpires, every decision ever made has been wrong. Um, but for the many years I've been an under 14 uh, coach of cricket, I think I played against you. Did, did, did you, you, you played in the team in Oakley, didn't you? Did you play down in Oakley? Not in, uh, not in, not in Oakley, it was a, a, a box hill report, it was the association, and, uh, and prior to that was in the Churches League, the Churches Association. But we used to go from over yeah, to over. about so nineteen ninety two, ninety three. Yeah, around, around quite a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we may have crossed paths. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember catching against you. Any other any other questions before uh, <laughs> we break? Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 Just a point of interest. You were saying about short side and you look at the person next to you. You didn't do that during the exam. Uh, there were <laughs> 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 I, it was interesting to note on that when it came to studies, uh, as much as I um, love my sport, obviously my, my studies were neglected as a result. And during BC, during the time my parents actually separated, that's something I didn't mention, um, I was actually working uh, part time at a producer. I got a job at a producer part time as a kitchen hand. And uh, as a result of working 21 hours a week, I was doing during BC. And for some reason, I chose all the hardest subjects in BC, whether um, uh, English, uh, chemistry, physics, math methods, special, uh, general maths, um, accounting, and infotech. And uh, the reason I chose those subjects was because I knew that that would give me the best options for, for uni, even though I really didn't wasn't prepared for it and didn't have the time to study and put the effort in to, to do that. 
and yes, a, a big part of, of my, my failings in, in school was because I was short-sighted and I couldn't see the board. Even when I sat close, I still couldn't see the board, which made it very difficult. And you know, when the, I would ask, be asked a question or asked to read something, it was, it was a very difficult. I'd always try to avoid it somehow, somewhere or another. So yes, that hindered me in, in many ways. It wasn't until after I got into TAFE that I got contacts actually, uh, and then that was a whole really some life, if you like. Um, further to that, uh, with, with uh, working with Rick Rooster, um, I actually, uh, in 1990, sorry, when I finished my VCE, I ended up um, not getting the results I needed to get into uni at the time. And uh, that was disheartening because, as I said, my background and my uh, relatives all being uh, well educated, etc., um, having to tell them that I didn't have the marks to get into uni was a big thing. Uh, but I did manage to get into TAFE and do computer systems. And, after completing TAFE, I went down that route, but the good news is after completing TAFE, well actually, sorry, in 1998 I dropped out of uh, TAFE because of the situation, I just couldn't handle it anymore, and in 1999 I took a year off and was working with Rooster and a, and a few other factory type jobs, um, and that's when I came to know the Lord. So 19, after 1999, I had the desire to go back to study and finish my course, so I finished my uh, diploma, got my diploma, and not just got it, but got high distinction. So for the first time in my life, I actually did really well in school. Uh, and then got into uni. I got into uni and uh, did my degree in computing. And uh, and then soon after, and that's when of course I met Stephen. And soon after that, again, I did exceptionally well in, in, in completing my uni university course, getting distinctions and high distinctions, which was unheard of throughout my high school years. Uh, I believe God certainly gave me the wisdom and, um, and the focus, if you like, to, to do well in my studies. So I, accept, I excelled there and, and then getting the job at GS1. And, uh, and I've been with the company GS1 actually for 17 years now, um, you know, and so it's been a, a great ride and uh, I've many challenges along the way. And uh, Stephen can testify for the growth that he's seen in me over the years. Um, and uh, under, under Stephen as the CIO, um, you know, I've achieved a lot, I guess, especially in recent years of how I've been and so forth. So God has really worked in me and, and, and brought me to the place that I am today. And I'm excited to see what he has for the future. But um, it's, it's, it's been an amazing story of where I've come from to where I am and where, where we're going. So all glory well, to, to God. On that note, uh, what put your hands together for? Uh, Can I ask you, how did you ask Stephen about six? Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, as, 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 as a young Christian, as a young believer at the time, it was uh, 2004, uh, but I have been a Christian since 1999. And of course, I was into uh, in times because year 2000, the white UK and Barry Smith at the time, uh, I was uh, obviously intrigued by this. Now, my question to him, if I recall correctly, I said it along the lines of, what, what do you see the implication, implications of this technology, barcodes? You know, where do you see it heading? What's, what's, what's the, where's the end goal? I was leaning towards that, or alluding to the fact that ultimately we're going to have a mark of the chip, the mark of the beast, and it will be implanted in our skin in some way. And so um, the barcode has the number 666 kind of embedded in it, and, and that's what I was just alluding to, because I knew he was a Christian too. So I, it wasn't to, I guess, throw you off in any way, but rather I was, it was a genuine question, uh, and, and that's where it came from, I guess, in, in that regard. I just wanted to see if he was aware, working for a company like GS1, of what that technology could be used for. We, we, we tag products and things today, but there's a chance we could tag people, you know, a number of people. So uh, that's where I was coming from in, in that in regards to that. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, but, but he answered it very well. So uh, to his My question is, well, are you saying that Stephen was the guy who implemented 666? <laughs> 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 well, you know, it's funny because uh, the people who work at GS1 are all good people. And I don't think they have any other intentions and probably do not foresee where that technology could go. But as Christians, I think we can see where that technology could go if in the wrong hands, you know, under an antichrist or something. So, yes, from that perspective, um, you know, but, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm so glad that you implemented 666 in Australia. From now on, I will tell all my friends. I know the guy who started this. <laughs> Thanks, I'm here again. Uh, and I'll just conclude this uh, before 10 o'clock, okay? If, uh